on the scene He's got the voice that's mean Asking those questions that you never seen He's got that fire Burning bright and clean Andrew Keen Making waves Break the routine On the keen on show He brings the heat Asking the minds Digging deep till they bleed No sugar coated truths No lies to deceive Andrew Keen The master of the interview beat the knowledge he's got the flair challenging ideas with a fearless stare with every question he's uncovering what's there andrew key the true seeker he's aware hello everybody it's thursday october the 3rd 2024 yesterday i did a show i recorded last week actually in london with the financial times is andrew hill who's running their uh best business books for 2024. We talked about the short list, which they've just published. And one of the books uh, on the list was an interesting one called Tribal, How the Cultural Instincts That Divide Us Can Help Bring Us Together. The book is actually out this week. And we're going to be talking to its author, uh, Michael Morris, in a second. He's our guest today. But before we begin, I asked Andrew Hill how tribal, how the cultural instincts that divide us can bring us together, how they considered that a business book, because it didn't sound like one to me. And this was Andrew Hill's response. And then we'll get to Michael Morris. This book, uh, which is also one that's been selected, as it were, sight unseen because it's not published yet and came to us in, pr in the sort of proof form, is a book about business uh, and management and the behavior of teams. And he is very careful to use examples across the whole range from politics. Lee Kuan Yew gets a mention uh, for what he's done in Singapore, but also uh, the business uh, elements of the book, uh, which some of our uh, judges actually pointed out when we were selecting the shortlist that this was a book that they'd wish they'd had when they were a CEO or when they were managing a big team. Well, Michael is joining us. Uh, the book is out to, uh, this week. Michael, congratulations on the book. Before we get to what you argue in the book, what would be your response to skeptics like myself that this isn't really a business book? Andrew Hill thinks it is. You teach at Columbia University and, yeah. and some time in the business school. So you're obviously a, a, a cross-disciplinary type. But do you think of yeah. Tribal as a business book? I do. Yeah, I've taught at the world's top business schools for decades, you know, at Columbia for 20 years, at Stanford for 10 years. I've taught at LBS in London and the best business schools in, in Europe and Asia. So it's been my life's work uh, teaching business leaders. Uh, I think the book started as a pure business book about how to, how to give people a toolkit for leading through culture. And I'm delighted to hear that these uh, former CEOs uh, found it useful. Um, I'm a behavioral scientist by training, and my particular field is called cultural psychology. So we study how cultural frameworks shape people's decisions and behavior, et cetera. And uh, so the book started as, as kind of a playbook for using what we've learned about cultural psychology to shape organizational cultures or to you know, shape the, the culture of a community, the culture of a school, the culture of a sports team. And then, you know, it's turned into something a little bit broader than a business book uh, because of what's going on in the world. Yeah, I like the thesis of the book um, because it's so counterintuitive and will make some people uncomfortable. Here's Andrew Hill's reading of, of the book how we work in teams, how to harness that for uh, positive benefits rather than defaulting to what we generally consider to be the uh, problem with tribalism, which is that we're divided into warring tribes or feuding groups. Uh, and his point, very forcefully made with lots and lots of examples, is, you know, in fact, this is a human, innate human um, trait that can be used for benefit if we know how to go about making our teams work better together. So, uh, and I was relying on Andrew's a very intelligent reader, Michael. I think he, he got uh, it right. Um, yeah. You're, uh, uh, you, probably, you probably should pay him something if you win the award. <laughs> um, so is the thesis of the book is that, like it or not, we're all in tribes. Some of us may claim we're not. Maybe then we're in the tribe that claims it's not in tribes. And given that, mm, and given how clever. 
theoretically divisive tribes are, um, your argument is actually being in tribes doesn't mean that we can't work together. And actually, the tribal quality of life is uh, something that can unite us rather than divide us. Is that fair? That's fair. And I think there was a very deep insight you had that we're part of the tribe that doesn't consider itself a tribe. You know, think about the famous Apple ads where they portrayed Microsoft people as these tech drones and, and, and the Apple user as this young Steve Jobs-like creative. Uh, and so it's creating this out group as a foil for the in group. But obviously, the Apple culture is just as conformist as the Microsoft culture. It's just conforming to a different set of habits and worshiping a different set cultural hero and, uh, you know, relishing a different set of traditions. I, and I have to admit this, it won't come as a surprise to lots of the listeners. I really consider myself independent, not part of a tribe. But can anyone escape tribes, Michael? Well, you know, I think... Um, you, we, we can. I mean, we, li we live, you know, the United States, England, in the most individualistic cultures of the world. And there's a philosophical tradition like Nietzsche, who said, uh, you know, the individual has to struggle to avoid being overwhelmed by the tribe, but you become most human when you're alone. That's the, that's the area where my views have really changed from the years of research I've done. I, I don't think you can be a human if you're totally alone. Uh, it's the essence of humanity that we're embedded in groups, we're embedded in communities. Uh, but we can choose to be relatively individualistic, and that often means that we are more able to engage in independent thinking and individual creativity, but perhaps we're a little less able to engage in collective projects because of our, you know, our standoffishness or our independence. Mike, we don't need me to tell you that many people consider America dangerously divided, particularly in the run-up to the election. One of the things that you argue in the book, and is this th the theme of, of your arguments, is that uh, we can actually bridge the red and the blue tribes in America, not by meeting in the middle, but by recognizing our difference. Explain how America can, so to speak, come together while us at the same time being proud of our ideologies, our geographies, our cultures. Yeah, this is a great point because one of the reasons I wrote the book is to try to push back against a trope that I call toxic tribalism. And it's something that has emerged among the pundits in the last decade. And it's this kind of amateur, amateur uh, biology idea that we have a drive to hate outsiders and that it has somehow atavistically reawakened and, and now we're screwed. We can't get the genie back into the bottle. We can't talk to each other anymore. And it makes for colorful journalism, but it's a pretty pessimistic story and it's a pretty inaccurate description of tribal instincts. It's not one that any evolutionist or any behavioral scientist would recognize. We have these uh, tribal instincts, but they're instincts for solidarity, not instincts for hostility. Uh, a species that was primarily oriented towards hating neighbors would not be as successful as our species. Um, but then the question is, how do these mostly helpful tribal instincts sometimes contribute to conflicts? And I think the, the partisan conflict between the red and blue tribes is a, is a great example of what I call epistemic tribalism, where conformist information processing starts happening way more than we realize. Uh, and it's it's happened because of the residential sorting of the country. The you know the the blue tribe moved to the coasts and to the college towns. The red tribe moved to the exurbs in the country. And then the splintering of the media landscape compounded that. You know from cable news networks to websites to social media newsfeed. And so we think that we're informed because we're getting more news than ever. But we're getting news from a relatively narrow band of the spectrum. And uh, as a result, uh, we, we kind of live in different realities than the other side, and we're kind of baffled. Do they really believe what they're saying? You know, do, do, do Republicans really believe that p pets are being abducted in Ohio? But then they, they, um, they're baffled by us. Like, why do Democrats keep repeating this stuff about J.D. Vance and his couch? You know, it's not in his book. It's just something that somebody made up. So, uh, you know, we, we, 
each tribe has its falsehoods that recirculate. And then from the vantage of the other tribe, it, it looks irrational and it looks insincere and it looks like the other tribe is in a grip of an ideology. And so there, there is this movement now of, kind of trying to bridge the red-blue divide. And it Yeah, to... um, movements like Braver Angels, we've done lots of shows yep. on that. But I wonder yeah, yeah. whether you approve of that, whether that really is the fix by sort of by, by, by meeting in the middle. Can tribes meet in the middle, so to speak? They can. And, and you know, co throughout history, it's not like the cultures, the national cultures or the corporate cultures have existed in a vacuum from each other. They've constantly been learning from each other. They've con sometimes they polarize away from each other uh, to have sharper, you know, sharper definition. But uh, the cultures exist in a system and they can learn from each other. But there, there are times, th there are differences between these programs like Braver Angels that make a huge difference. There's one set of programs that has names like Hello from the Other Side or Red Meets Blue. Um, and the problem with those programs is that they've been found to actually cause polarization because I'm, I'm hyper conscious that I'm talking to somebody of the opposite party and I'm not thinking of them as a peer. I'm not allowing peer influence to happen. Instead, I'm defending myself against everything they say. But then there's a different set of programs. And I'll, some examples are, there's one called Make America Dinner Again. One is called Coffee Party USA. One is called Open Lands. And it basically brings together bipartisan groups to talk about issues that are not political. You know, coffee, food, uh, you know, how, how land should be used. These, these issues, these passions cross cut the red and the blue tribes. And what, what the studies have found is that these, these seemingly less uh, effective, uh, these seemingly less goal oriented uh, conversations actually do more to bring people together, to make people more open to the other side because they produce lasting conversations and they don't put people on defense. So I think that the, you know, the best thing that we can do to try to, you know, come out of our bubbles is, you know, join a soccer team, you know, uh, take up fly fishing, you know, do, do things like that, which uh, cut across partisan lines. It's, it's a Tocquevillian solution, Michael. You talked about toxic tribalism. I wonder whether the, the notion of tribalism itself is has been sort of toxically treated in, 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 in the modern age with its foundations in anthropology and the assumptions that uh, non-industrial, pre-industrial societies are tribal and we aren't. What's the history of tribalism over the last hundred years as a concept? Well, it's a, it's a great question. So the, uh, the field of anthropology used to have tribe as its core construct. That way, I mean, it's, you know, it's Margaret Mead, isn't it? Yeah, she was part of that. She was a part of that. Uh, but they were all, you know, for more than 100 years, you know, that was the basic uh, concept. Uh, but um, at a certain point, anthropologists became very self-critical and they realized that the classical anthropologists were more or less in league with imperialist governments uh, and colonialist governments. Uh, and so there was pressure on early social thinkers in the era of colonial expansion to contrast European civilizations with non-Western tribes. And that was pure politics, not science. Some of these non-Western tribes had more advanced mathematics than many of the European civilizations. And some of them were larger and some of them had more impressive architecture. You know, we're talking about the Incas and some of these enormous African civilizations. So, uh, that is something that has been a embarrassing hangover for the field of anthropology for the longest time. And some parts of anthropology have opted out of the sciences entirely, and they've become more like a branch of literary criticism. And some branches, you know, have banned the word tribe, you know, like it's a, it's a, it's a inherently pejorative word, but I don't think it is an inherently pejorative word. And I wonder if there's, it, it, of all this is coincidental. There's a kind of cultural zeitgeist going on, I think, in America. I noticed it with a number of the guests on the show about, so to speak, the rehabilitation of pre-colonial life in America. The argument that 
the peoples who existed before the Europeans showed up in the 15th century were just as advanced, just as civilized, in some ways less violent. Um, might it be more than coincidental, Michael, that business professors, psychologists like <laughs> yourselves are rediscovering the benefits of tribalism at the same time as historians of America are beginning to question the very foundations of the, 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 the traditional American narrative between uh, the pre-European world, which essentially got destroyed by the Europeans, and then American civilization, if that's the right word. I think you're right about that. I think this country has always had a, a deep, ambivalent relationship with the, the native nations, uh, and you know, and we have our own hangover. And we of thought guilt. of them, sorry to, to jump in here, but they've often been described, for better or worse, as tribes. Yes, they have been. And so I think this notion of tribe, you know, like there's a whole tradition in American literature, like the last of the Mohicans, you know, portraying Native Americans as noble savages in contrast to the, you know, corrupt and soft and uh, decadent uh, European uh, descendants in the cities. But, you know, the point that I make in this book is that, you know, that's not the earliest use of the word tribes. Tribes is a Latin word that the Romans used to refer to the ethnic groups like Etruscans that made up the early nation. And then it became the word used for administrative reasons like Gaul when they had an empire. And then it it came into other languages through translations of the Bible in the 11th century, like the, the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, and then by Shakespeare's time, you know, it was used to refer to the Scots. It was used to refer to the Jewish diaspora of Europe. It was used to refer to these non-Western nations that they were learning about. And it had no pejorative connotation until colonialism and imperialism. So, and I think in Europe, you know, there has also been a sort of romantic primitivism, you know, Rousseau, you know, the noble savage before, uh, before capitalism and excess consumption. So I, I think we, we have a... Uh, we have a romanticism about pre-industrial times and pre-small-scale uh, societies. Uh, there's probably some deep, deep satisfactions of life in a small-scale society that we don't have because we're, you know, we're inherently removed from that. You're not a historian of religion, Michael. You're, you know a lot about a lot of things. You mentioned the his, uh, Jews as um, history of Judaism as a kind of tribe, and they position themselves as perhaps a, a special tribe, at least in metaphysical terms. Do you think that in, a, in an odd way, Christianity was itself the first universal movement against the notion of tribalism? Well, I'm not a historian of religion. I, I've been told that, you know, before Christianity, there were, there were something like a hundred other cults where the uh, the leader of the cult came back from death after three days, and you know, so I think uh, I don't I think Christianity was the successful one, the one that you know turned into a world religion. I don't know whether it was the first, but I think the universalism of Christianity, you know, is is part of what made it go viral because you know anyone, unlike say Judaism, which has a somewhat conflicted relationship with proselytizing, you know, Christianity uh, always had the assumption that everybody belonged, everybody should be a Christian. Yeah, I think Groucho Marx, very wise man, made a joke about clubs or tribes saying he always wanted to be a <laughs> member of the club or tribe that wouldn't let him in. Um, do most tribes then have conceptions of themselves which, which suggest some element of exclusivity or at least a front door where you have to at least knock on the door and introduce yourself and be allowed in or can are there some tribes where just anyone can join i think you know groups need to have boundaries part of what you know part of what creates a group identity is a sense of distinctiveness and if you look at all different societies um not every society thinks that they're the most technologically advanced. Not every society thinks that they're the most peaceful, but almost every society has a belief tradition that they are somehow more humane than 
the the out group that they compare themselves with and it may be that you know one one type of inuit you know is focused on the other type of inuit that lives slightly to the north um uh, in a lot of uh indigenous cultures the name for their group is is synonymous with the name for person or human you know so we 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 regard our group as more human more humane uh more moral uh than we regard out groups and that's part of what uh, motivates people to you know cooperate with their group and make sacrifices for their group michael you suggest that tribes are manifest and manifold um that their churches their political parties uh, i mean when does the tribe stop and something else begin <laughs> <laughs> or is any association between two people theoretically a tribe? Well, again, here, you know, my usage is more the usage that comes out of evolutionary biology, you know, which is that a, a tribe is the, it's the distinctive form of social organization of our species compared to other primates, you know, so it's, it's very broad. And what's distinctive about our species is that we can live in larger communities that are united by shared culture, uh, by shared beliefs and shared practices, whereas other primates, their, uh, their communities are united by the fact that you are blood relations or the fact that you have developed a direct personal bond with every other member of the group. Chimpanzee troops, you know, if they get larger than 50 or 60 individuals, they, they splinter into a, into a war of faction against faction because uh, there's no way that all the individuals can bond with each other. And that is sort of the superpower of our species, this capacity to belong to these very large communities where even if someone is a total stranger, we can trust them because their behavior is predictable to us because they understand the way that we think. And we belong to multiple tribes and have for thousands of years. So we have sort of overlapping memberships and we have smaller groups nested within larger groups. And that's part of where the dynamism of culture comes from, that we all have, we all have many cultural identities. We have many tribes inside us. And depending on the situation that we're in, one tribe comes to the fore or one, another tribe comes to the fore. And the levers for leaders come from these situational cues. Leaders have, al some leaders have always been good at intuiting this and they know, you know, they know that if they need their engineers to think like engineers, we should hold the meeting in, in the workshop. Uh, but if we want the engineers to think like practical business people, then we should hold the meeting in the, in the boardroom. You know, the situations that we're in bring different cultural frames to mind. Michael, one of the other books on the short list is by Andrew Scott. He's actually was on the show last year. It's called The Longevity Imperative, How to Build a Healthier and More Productive Society to Support Our Longer Lives. Um, he's a very articulate guy. He's at the London Business School. I'm sure you know okay. him and his work. I've heard of him. Um, yeah. But I, I wonder whether age also is tribal. It seems as if Lots of people worry about America dividing into the young and old baby boomers versus Generation X and Y and Z. How does age play into tribalism and how can we get beyond that, the, our, our cultural instincts to be able to talk to people of different generations? Yeah, I experience this a lot as a teacher. You know, my, uh, my uh, pop cultural references go over like a lead balloon because they're all about Seinfeld and television shows that are, you know, <laughs> that are, uh, you know, distant memories to, uh, to these students uh, today. Um, I so think what, that, what does that mean? You mean you, you try and make a joke and no one laughs? Nobody laughs. And then, you know, when they make a joke, I don't get it, you know, <laughs> because it's about, you know, it's about some meme that is widely circulated on TikTok or something uh, that I'm, I'm not privy to. But I, I always try to have a few students or a, or a teaching assistant who is my pipeline, you know, who I can say, what example would make this point, you know, to these guys, even if I don't really know that example well, I, I can throw it out. Uh, and if there's something I don't understand in class, I'll ask them and then I'll follow up on it in the next class to show the students that I'm trying to get up to speed. You know, I'm trying to understand their, 
their way of thinking, their language, their references. But it's 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 crazy. I'm I'm a you know Gen X bordering on a baby boomer, and I'm married to a millennial, you know, an old older millennial, but a millennial. And these concepts that that she uses, like you know, she accused me of gaslighting our cat last week, and I was like, how how can I gaslight the cat? The cat doesn't was really. Was she have a serious, cat. Michael? And you're still married? <laughs> <laughs> she what was because gaslighting I, your cat. Well, to me, gaslighting means you know you're causing... didn't eat it, did you? A la JD Vaughn. <laughs> <laughs> to me, gaslighting means that you're causing someone to think that they're mentally ill. But I think for the millennials, the definition has broadened, and so it means something more like you're confusing somebody. So I think that you know the same word you know takes on a different meaning. Just like I use I use the word tribal differently than some pundits and differently than some political scientists, you know, who would who would say, oh, there's only a few societies in the world that that have tribes. And I'm saying, well, no, but in a more general sense, you know, the this human uh, form of social organization can be called tribes and the evolved psychology that that enabled that way of living is called tribal instincts by by the people who study it. And I think tribal instincts are important for us all to understand now more than ever, you know, because we we live in a, a world where there's lots of uh, group conflict and we have to understand that these cultures, these cultures are not permanent fixtures. There are levers we can use to to d redirect cultures or to or to bring out different identities or to to raise uh, superordinate identities that are inclusive and make two sides uh, feel on the same page. Michael, I have to admit that when I'm with the younger generation, with my kids or their friends, it gives me pleasure to miss up, to, to not only be misunderstood, <laughs> but to express complete uh, disbelief of whatever they're saying. Um, Why does it give you pleasure? to be a, a bridge builder. I like to destroy bridges. Is, is there any value to that, to conflict in cultural terms? Well, it helps them. I mean, your behavior helps them remember that this thing that is so obvious to them is particular to their generation and it's not uh, a concept or a label for a concept that is going to be shared with everyone uh, it, and it may not be shared with the younger generation you know there are things that are specific to gen z uh like for example you know the the the, the sociology suggests that you know the the um being gender binary is a very, very common thing in Gen Z, m more so than in the prior generation, and more so than in the later generation. So it's it's a it's and no, but you know I, I don't I haven't heard a good theory about why, but it's it's just sort of a different ideal that characterizes that generation, uh, and it's important you know for people to understand you know culture to us is like water to the fish you know we we don't see it because it surrounds us and. Uh, but we 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 should get to know it because someday we'll be a fish out of water and we need to understand what the other people are, are thinking. Are there concepts, Michael, that cross cultures or cross tribes? I've got a show coming up with the great UC Berkeley sociologist, Ali Russell Hothchild. She has a new yeah. book out, Stro Stolen Pride, Loss. It's all about loss and shame and the rise of the right, but it's also about the rise of the left. And she argues she's a, she's a wonderful writer and a wonderful thinker i mean i'm a, I'm a huge fan i think yeah, she, I mean, she's one of she, the great treasures distill. of american uh, intellectual yeah. life but she seems to argue that both loss and shame and pride these are the universals that cut across geographies cultures yeah. religions classes is that fair yes totally those are evolved emotions that are closely related to some of the emotions that other primates have, those are very deep. So there's I, some anthropologists make excessive claims about the, the differences in the emotional experiences of different cultures. But, you know, if there, there's sort of like eight basic emotions that have a standard facial expression that characterizes them, that is automatic. And you can show people from a Brazilian tribe, you know, photographs of American college students, and they can guess accurately uh, what emotion that person is feeling. 
Um, so the connotations of emotions, yes, differ, and the the sort of accent on expressions. You know, J Japanese people smile with their eyes, but not so much with their mouth. Um, Careful, American Michael, you're getting into trouble on that one. Yeah? <laughs> well, no, it's even their emoji, even the emoji they use for a smile is about the eyes, not about the mouth. Um, but uh, Americans have these ridiculously broad smiles. Um, uh, so there, there are differences in the parameters, but the, the basic you, you just explain template. to me why I'm not particularly popular in America because I never <laughs> smile. Um, and, and I went to Ali in her book. She, she went to Kentucky and she managed to sit down with everyone, neo-Nazis, left, yeah, black, yeah. whites, uh, Asian people, everybody. Because she sort of emanates... I think sympathy did, 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 did is that true and, and and did you have to do that or or should we have to all do that i mean if, if all americans were like arlie hothchild i don't i think we'd be in a better situation yes but if my grandmother was a bicycle i could ride it home you know, like, i think that's a it's a big leap you know she's yeah. a, she's extraordinary not just her insight but her empathy and her gift for connection uh, you know, I don't, I don't know her well. I've seen her speak. But when I read, I really loved her book, um, Strangers in Their Own Land. That was the big hit. The, this was, that was the previous book. Yeah. And it really captured, I, I get asked a lot because of tribalism, like, what is this, what is this resentment of white men towards the changing demography of the nation? And I think it's because they, she, she said it best, they feel like they're being cut in line. You know that they're they're waiting in line and expecting to move into a position of affluence and and respect like their fathers and grandfathers did, but suddenly there are all these new people, these super talented immigrants and these uh, you know minorities who are no longer you know repressed and uh, they're not all occup occupying places that are as good as their parents did you know so the american dream can't be taken for granted anymore but i think she captured it so well with this you know colloquial vernacular metaphor of being cut in line and the the sense of outrage or the sense of unfairness that comes from that michael one of the, the things i've never quite understood is how pessimistic everybody is in america these days they always begin every conversation with well in these difficult times and i wonder it doesn't seem to me at least to be any more difficult in the 2020s as i don't know the 1920s or the 1970s or 80s but anyway um i wonder whether the fact that a lot of people consider these days to be rather difficult has to do with changing the the, the changing nature of culture and the way in which our tribes are so fluid almost plastic one of the Headlines today from the New Yorker is can uh, Harris stop blue collar workers from defecting to Donald Trump? There's a big imminent strike at the moment, which is yeah. anti Biden, anti Harris. H how do we make sense when the working class, for example, shifts white or perhaps even the, the brown working class shift its allegiance from one party to another or from one belief or another? Is that when we all get very worried and un un uncertain, but doesn't also reflect the health, the vitality of culture. Because if, if nothing ever changed, then culture would be really boring. I agree completely. I agree completely that it's, it's, it's great that people feel that either party might be the best choice for them and, and that no one party can take for granted a particular a sector of the uh, of the populace. Um, I do think that uh, the Democratic Party, as part of this sorting that I talked about earlier, you know, you have this sort of movement of liberals to the coastal cities and the university towns, and there's this sense of the verbal class, this elite group of smarty pants people who don't know or care about the real America. Uh, right, and you and I. Touch well, yeah, I think we were guilty as charged, you know. Um, I mean, I grew up in a, a blue collar town that was somewhat rural. And so my friends from that time in my life, they tell me that everyone supports Trump around there. And I, you know, it's, I don't know why they think Trump is similar to them or understands them because I don't think he does. But he, you know, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And I think that Trump attacks 
the the liberal you know the 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 liberal shibboleths that these people also resent um and so uh i think that you know harris made an inspired choice with with tim walls because he he more genuinely more authentically than trump or even jd vance he is a guy who grew up in a you know sort of middle class lower middle class environment you know he he was a high school teacher. He was in the Army Reserve. Um, I've heard him described as an REI candidate rather than a DEI candidate. REI is this camping store because he, he's the only one who looks like he's ever gone camping or fishing, you know, or, or you know, he's the only one who can fix a car. Uh, so I think, you know, he, he uh, had a mixed performance the other night, but I think uh, he's an inspired choice because, you know, Biden has the common touch. And I think Tim Walls has the common touch and can at least stem some of that defection. I think some of that defection is also sexist. You know, it's, it's when it comes to when it comes to the the defection of blue collar men uh, or you know less wealthy, less educated men from the Democratic Party. Uh, I think part of it is that they they have a harder time identifying with a woman and with a, a woman of color. Um, and a, and a very successful professional woman, uh, and so that's that's part of it. And and I think her choice of Tim Walls was an inspired choice because he has a lot more authentic basis for connecting with uh, blue collar men and sort of the ordinary Amer Americans of the of the Midwest and elsewhere. Michael, what has language got to do? You mentioned Trump. I've always thought that his use of language reflects perhaps a, a different way of using words, that the coastal elites treat his words in one way and his supporters treat them in another way. Do, do each tribes, do tribes have different kinds of language, symbolic or otherwise? And then how can those be bridged if, if people's use of language, which is so innate and essential to us, if it's so different? Well, uh, yeah, the language, you know, the the verbal codes, the linguistic codes are are one of the most basic things that defines a tribe. You know that we can we can understand each other, we can coordinate, we can share ideas in a common language, and that uh, that's true of occupational tribes and corporate tribes as well. There are keywords and uh, phrases that mean something different if you work at Microsoft than if you work at Oracle or if you work at uh, Google. Um, now, there are always people who are bilingual and multilingual, and uh, these people are translators, and they are people who, you know, can gain power through their ability to bridge tribes. Uh, and so I think now coming back to Trump, I yeah, I mean, Trump, uh, you know, let's be more specific. Trump has accused Harris of being retarded. I think he used the word. Um, a lot of coastal types, of course, were profoundly offended. They get pleasure, it seems, of uh, being offended by him. But I'm not sure he really meant it in that in those ways. I, I'm certainly no great fan of Trump, and I don't want to defend him. But his use of language seems so symbolic and understood in one one very concrete way by his supporters and in a profoundly different one by the people who don't like him. Yeah, I think that um, part of using language is the gesture of choosing a word which, you know, shows its signals that you don't kowtow to this liberal piety. Uh, now, you know, when I was... When I was a kid, you know, that word was used more broadly when when somebody did something unwise, you know, you would. But that uh, now that's considered to be a, re a really offensive word to throw around. And I, you know, I think that's probably a very positive development. But I think when Trump is using it that way, you're right. He's not just trying to describe Kamala Harris. He's signaling to people that he doesn't adhere to these new sensitive conventions of language that he's going to talk the way they talked when they were growing up and nobody can stop him from doing it. Two more quick questions, Michael, because I know we both need to get back to our tribes. Um, 
<laughs> what about the issue of morality? Um, one of the problems, I think, with red and blue America is that they each, it's not that they're so much divided, but they each consider themselves to be superior, particularly in a moral sense. Um, can we have tribes that have no use, no value for morality, or is morality somehow been built into tribalism? I mean, morality is built into what, you know, what I call in the book, you know, the hero instinct, you know, this idea that we, we attend to what our community values and thinks of as good, and we aspire to that, in part because we gain status and we gain tribute. So it's not entirely altruistic. You know, there's, there are benefits for the hero in being a hero. Uh, so yeah, I think- very Nietzsche. Yes, it is. It's there's a lot of Nietzsche and in, in a lot of insight in Nietzsche that I think has been borne out in in studies. Uh, so what's interesting about the red and blue difference is that there are there are different moral foundations, different you know evolved bases of moral concern, and the uh, the blue tribe and the red tribe prioritize them differently. So the blue tribe cares a lot about social justice, about fairness, like does this group have the same number of resources as that group? Whereas the red tribe cares about things like sanctity and, you know, respect for authority, which are, you know, moralized conceptions in, in most cultures of the world. And so it's not so much that one tribe you know, cares about morality and the other doesn't, but what they mean by morality is different. But it's useful to know that, like a politician who's trying to reach across the aisle and trying to get Republicans or even conservative Democrats to vote for an environmental bill is much better served by expressing the argument in terms of sanctity, like we need to protect this God-given earth, you know, we are the stewards of a sacred blah, blah, blah. You know, much more, they're going to be much more uh, resonant by using the moral lexicon of the Red Tribe than if they do what they usually do, which is using their own go-to moral lexicon, talking about social justice, and talking about, you know, some groups are more affected by global warming or more affected by uh, pollutants. Uh, and so those kinds of logics convince other Democrats, but that's not who needs to be convinced. If you wanna convince conservatives, speak their language. Final question. Your book was included on uh, Adam Grant's uh, 12 interesting books to fire up your brain this fall. We've had several of them on the show, others, including uh, Bridget Scholte, who has a new book out, Overwork, Transforming the Daily Grind in the Quest for a Better Life. I wonder, mm -hmm. um, when it comes to future tribes, you're in the business school, so in a sense, you're a futurist. Mm. What are the future tribes of the 21st century? In our age of AI, are we ultimately mid to late 21st century? Are we going to be divided by those who work and those who don't? Uh, I thought you were going to ask whether we're divided between the artificially intelligent and the uh, organic. Well, all of that. I mean, that's another. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, yeah, that's yeah, even yeah. more interesting. The, yeah. Yeah. The, can, can machines, are they part of a tribe? I mean, some of my colleagues use AIs as personal assistants to brainstorm with. They they have it. They have them on speech mode, and they they talk about their research ideas, and they get feedback, and they they. Who are they? We should expose <laughs> them for their idiocy, Michael. Who are they? Oh, well, I I'm not going to name names, but I I I think um it's it's a real it's definitely a changing world. Um, I think that you know cultures regenerate themselves through processes of recombination and through selective forgetting and, and, and borrowing from other cultures. And we should welcome this hybridization and, and not be, uh, pr not take a preservationist attitude towards our, our cultures. You know, cultures are most authentic when they are historically distinct, you know, when, when something new has been created. Uh, and so I hope you know, so far it doesn't, there, there are a lot of fears about, you know, mass unemployment uh, due to automation. It used to be robots, now it's AI, but I, I don't really see it happening. You know, we have a really low unemployment rate in this country. You have a really low unemployment rate in Japan and other places where there's a lot of technology. So 
I, I don't know that empirically that's been borne out well. It's a, it's a reasonable fear. But, you know, these, these new jobs that get created are, are a little harder to envision, but they happen. And the other um, rather pessimistic, even existential vision of the, the future is of an invasion of extraterrestrials. We're more and more obsessed with that. If, if we were indeed invaded, Michael, by extraterrestrials, they may look like us, they may not, they may come in bottles or peculiar machines. Would that get rid of tribalism? Would we finally reach an end to all this nonsense of division if we united against another life form, we humans? That would be the best thing ever for the UN, you know, which uh, which struggles to uh, to create uh, international cooperation. Um, I think, you know, uh, yeah. A common... Isn't the UN though a kind of tribe in itself? <laughs> It is. I mean, it's it's a it's a funny subset of the New York City landscape. The UN. It used to be that they none of them paid their parking tickets because they had diplomatic immunity. Uh, so you could tell who was in the UN because they would park right in front of restaurants. Um, but uh, it's a it's a funny organization. It's got its own distinct culture. Uh, but yeah, I think if we do discover, you know, if we go to Mars or if we do discover other civilizations. That might that might be a good thing for the humans uh, in in recognizing that we have more in common than we have as differences. Well, Michael Mar uh, Morris, I was going to call you Moritz, but he's a VC in, <laughs> in, in the I know. Bay Area. I know the he is. Yeah. Tribal: How the cultural instincts that divide us can help bring us together. It's already been shortlisted. It's only out this week for the FT Book of the Year. Sure, it's going to get lots of other acclaim. Thank you so much. I'm going to let you go back to your tribe. I, as I said <laughs> earlier, I don't have a tribe, so some people can let me know if I can join their tribe. <laughs> Best of luck, Michael, with the book, and congratulations. We'll get you back on the show after the election when everyone's going to be even more pessimistic and we can talk about bringing people together. I'd love to come back and continue this conversation. So many, so many great seeds were planted in the, in the last 45 minutes. So. Uh, any any day just give me a call